Hey, let's pray. Does that sound like a good idea? Jesus, thank you for who you are. And I'm so grateful for this season, the Advent season, the season of, of really recognizing the anticipation of when you changed everything, that you became God with us in flesh here on earth. God, that should change the very fiber of who we are. And Lord, I pray today that it does. Lord, as we, we look at your word, as we remember your promises, God, as we are praying in with the leaders today, Lord, I, I, I just pray, Lord, that today would be a reawakening, maybe a restoration, or maybe just a birthing of a new hope in all of our hearts today. Or that we would be able to see beyond the circumstances, beyond the, the, the places that we are in, or Lord, the places that we think that we should be. God, we give you this time. We love you, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, if you have your Bibles today, you want to turn to Psalm 84. That's where we're going to be predominantly, and we'll get there in just a moment. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to gift one of those to you. You could see one of our team members, or uh, we will have them on the screens. And if all else fails, I will read it to you, right? I want to start, though, by reading a couple of verses out of Matthew 1, specifically verses 20 through 23. And um, when we use the pronoun he here, this specifically we're talking about Joseph. So I want to read this to you. It says, but after he, that's Joseph, had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So verse 22 now is going to allude to and actually point back to a prophecy that was written hundreds of years previous that we see in Isaiah 7:14. But verse 22 says this, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken to the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, everyone say that with me, God is with us. God is with us. This is the title for our Advent series, God with us. I love the season of Advent. I, I mentioned that before. This, this is, there's just, I don't know, it's, it, it's not just the Christmas thing. I, although I will say this, I know I share this almost every year, but like Christmas was great, and then I had children, and Christmas became a whole new level, <laughs> right? And, and that, can be, that can be all the different things, right? It can be really, really great. Like there's nothing quite like seeing the excitement on their faces on Christmas morning. But then it can also be like, all the stuff that comes with the kids and the programs and the things and the parties and all the stuff that I got to get to and don't, never mind the shopping and do we have enough for the finances and blah, blah, blah. I mean, right? Am I preaching to anybody today? It's a good day to talk about hope, isn't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you're unfamiliar, Advent, Advent comes from, uh, the, has the Latin root word of coming. It is quite literally, the anticipation, the celebration of Jesus' arrival. And that would be the incarnation. That is God becoming flesh. Fun side note, I have a, a friend, he's a pastor, his name is Joe uh, Avil. He lives in Decatur. He likes to actually call the incarnation um, God con carne, which is a little bit of a, a Spanish mass-up of God with meat. Incarnation. God concarne. God became flesh. No? That fell flat. Oh, wow. When he said it to me once, I, I just died because I, I know, like, you know, I, I speak Spanglish really, really well. Sorry, Christina. Um, God with us. Praise the Lord. <laughs> He's with me right now when you bomb on stage. Like, right here. Thanks, God. Appreciate it. But here's the thing. Holiday season is a mixed bag, right? 
So we talk about the different themes of Advent, and we're going to be talking about these over the next few weeks and presenting how God is with us and how he reminds us within these themes that he is still, still God with us, right? But we often talk about like, oh, this is the season of joy. I'm supposed to have joy? Like I, I'm grieving, I'm full of grief or I'm sadness, or maybe I've, I've just feel depressed, like just this overwhelming, ugh, right? The weather has changed, it's, it's not fun, um, or maybe I'm hurting, or peace. I'm supposed to have peace? Are you kidding? Peace, right? When I'm plagued with worry and fears and doubts, or maybe it's the, the bitterness that I'm carrying because of relational turmoil or things left unaddressed, or perhaps I'm supposed to celebrate love in this season, but I've never felt so lonely or forgotten or unloved or unvalued or maybe stressed or, or burnt out. And, and you talk about today is supposed to be all about hope, right? This week is supposed to be hope, and I'm celebrating that. But I feel hopeless, like there's nothing to hope for. And here's the thing. For, for believers, it's, it's easy to believe that God is with us when things are going good, Right? Up on the mountaintops, ooh, God, God has given me favor. I, I got to raise my fantasy team one by one point last week. True story. Praise the Lord. God was with me. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> or I got that parking spot or that Black Friday deal was in my cart before it was all gone. Where my kids are sleeping through the night. Glory. Somebody. Somebody. <laughs> Now, now I know where it lies. Okay, lean into that later, right? But it's more difficult to believe that God is with us when we're in the valley, when we're feeling alone, when we're feeling scared, when we're hurting, when we're wrestling with things, or we're getting bad news, or things don't go the way we thought that they should. See, the, the valley places, they're tough, right? They're tough, they're where the battles are fought. That's where we find our real space of desperation. And so today, we want to talk about God with us in the valley. God with us in the valley. Because we can experience the presence of God in very different ways in the valley versus the mountaintops. Because we may enjoy God on the mountaintops, right? It's good. There's nothing wrong with that. God blesses. God provides, we get to see the glory of the Lord fully in a lot of ways, right? But we experience Him much differently, and I would even say, as we'll see here, much more intimately when we're in the valleys. Um, I've mentioned this before, I, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of the book of Psalms, personally, because um, it's just some, like, legit humanity just bleeding through. In fact, when we look at the Psalms, there, there's, there's very, very, um, man, the, the fullness of desperation. It just, just go, just flip through. You'll find there's some good ones where they're, they're ascending, things are great. There's also some where it's like, God, uh, I need you to do something because nobody likes me and they're trying to kill me. Like, this, this, is, this, is, this is the real of the real. And so when we're looking at the Psalms, the Psalms are, are coming from a place of desperation, from the place of the valley. And that's kind of what we're going to look at here today in Psalm 84. And so if you've managed to get there, I'm going to go ahead and read and start with verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home. And the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay up her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Verse 4, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. So that's a, that's a, a note of pause. So let's take a moment and pause there for a section. Uh, because it's real important to, to point out here that if in some of your Bibles you may actually see it says that it's listed as a psalm of the sons of Korah. And who are those guys? Well, those guys were the sons of Korah who were a family of worship leaders who were appointed by King David. So they were worship leaders. And this, 
this psalm is really kind of a hymn. And some would actually say it's actually a processional hymn, meaning that it's something that was saying as you were going from one place to another. That's going to be important later, so hold on to that, okay? But specifically, this one was composed for the festival or the feast, excuse me, of tabernacles. Now, what was that? Like, where am I going with this? Someplace good, I promise, okay? Like, this isn't just a bunch of history and background, but it is important to understand the context here. Because the Feast of Tabernacles was supposed to be a feast to remind the people of God how he took care of them when they were wandering in the wilderness and they were taken out of Egypt. How God provided, how God took care of them. It was a a thing that was sung to call action to remember that we would set our minds on who God is and what it is that he can actually do. That's a big deal. And we'll see here in just a second here, this was likely a song that was written for these pilgrimages. Anybody feel like you're on a pilgrimage right now? Okay, let's use a different word. Anybody feel like they're on a journey? Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. And so this song, as we see here and we'll continue to read, was actually a song of anticipation. It was something that was an anticipation of longing for God's presence. Some commentaries actually call it the journey to joy. And yet, we still got to go through the valley. Anticipation. Isn't that the season of Advent? The anticipation of the arrival of Jesus Christ, the one who would set us all free? But here's the thing. Finding joy in the journey, your pilgrimage depends on what it is that you're thirsty for, what you're actually hoping for. Because if you're taking notes today, the valleys of life reveal where our true hope is. Think about that for a second. When I go through it, when I go through the valley, going through these spaces of desperation, and and I, I bet if I was to ask, everybody understands what that means. It reveals where it is that I put my hope, what I'm resting on, where it is that I'm, I'm looking for help from, or what it is I'm looking to actually numb the pain or just get over it or get out of it. But the thing is, even though this journey is one of anticipation, the psalmist recognizes that there is still going to be hardship. There's going to be these times where we encounter these things that don't go the way we expect them to go. So let's continue on then in verse 5. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways of Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. And they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. I got to pause there for a second because... You probably heard me say the Valley of Baca. You're like, Chewbacca? What is that? Right? Is this a very Christmas Star Wars special? That was terrible. We don't want that. I always try to like slip in some geek nerdiness there. That was it. You're welcome. And if you got it, you got it. If you didn't, I'm sorry. But the Valley of Baca here, if we're, we're talking about what this is, some, some would say that this is a literal place. Some would say maybe it's, it's not, but it represents the, the spaces of the valley, right? The spaces of desperation. But if you were looking at a literal space, it was that of a, a real kind of like dangerous space, kind of deserty, lots of thorns, wild animals, vipers, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, right? It was that kind of thing. Lots of ruffians that went through there trying to steal, kill, and destroy, right? It was nearly impossible to travel through it without facing trouble of hardship. In fact, some of the translations would actually translate this to the valley of tears or the valley of weeping or the valley of loss. So it's, it's, a, it's a real dangerous, rough space. But here's the thing. It's in these valleys of tears, of loss, and of desperation that we discover that our hope is either in something that can sustain us or something that's not. And so we often find maybe that our hope is actually misplaced 
In fact, I often find that my desperation in those seasons comes from misplaced hope. It's not necessarily that things are so bad. It's just that I have just been trying to do it on my own strength or I've been trying to put it on the weight of somebody else or something else or banking on something that was temporary and fleeting. And then as soon as it fell apart, I recognized where my hope actually was resting. So what does this passage teach us about keeping hope in the journey? I'm glad you asked. If you're taking notes, the first thing that we see within the passage we just read is that we need to seek God's strength. Seek God's strength. If you don't know God personally, if you don't have relationship, if you're not actually fostering and cultivating that relationship with God, you're not going to recognize his presence when it's there. I don't know how else to say that. Um, Because when you don't know God personally, you're not invested in that relationship, all you have is all you have. That's it. And so when that fails, then what? Then what? You become exhausted. You can't take it anymore. You don't think you're going to make it. But verse 5, how does it start? Blessed are those whose strength is in you. It doesn't say blessed are those who make it on their own. Blessed are those who help themselves. Blessed are those who save up a lot. Blessed are those who are banking on relationships. Blessed are those that have a good job and full health, no sickness. doesn't say that. We've been created to depend upon God. And might I just make a suggestion? Maybe take your relationship with God to the next level. Like, maybe up where you're at. I, I want to pause here for a second. Um, I was looking at my notes this morning. Not, oh, okay, well, Ill, <laughs> ill-timed, amen, that I did look at them, um, as I often do before. Um, but I actually made some edits here, because I'm like, you know, this sounds great. Like, this is what you're supposed to say at Christmas, Right? Oh, just, just trust, brother. Walking in victory, sister. You got to seek God's strength. It's like, what does that, what does that actually mean? And, and, I, and I don't want this to come across as a trite thing. Like, oh, yep, just seek God's strength. Next point, we'll get to three of them, and then we'll, we'll pack up and, and leave. But I, I just, I was drawn back to maybe a more recent personal experience uh, for those who aren't aware, it was a little over a year ago, our son was in a really, really, really bad bike accident. It had to be airlifted to Iowa City. There was a lot of just unknowns. God's miraculous hand was in the whole thing. And even today, he's, he's almost at 100% to fully restored and just no long-term effects. God has shown himself favorable. I can say that a year, almost a year and a half now. Guess where I was this time last year? I was in the valley. And in fact, I'll just be honest with you, there are still some times where the trauma of that event reverberates throughout my my life, my family's life, and we still find ourselves in the valley. And so when I sit up here and go, you need God's strength. You need to seek God's strength. I'm not just saying that because that sounds good, or that's what I'm supposed to say, and a message on hope preaches itself, because praise the Lord, just open the word, and there it is. No. No, this had to be a practical application for me because there are so many times, even still, where I recognize and realize I'm operating under my own strength. And so I'm, I'm anxious. I'm feeding into that, that anxiety and fear. I'm constantly looking for the next thing to fall out of the sky and hit me. So I'm going to be real with you, right? This is my own strength because I can't control everything, and that freaks me out. Anybody else? Yeah, don't like that, especially when it comes to my kids or my family and and, and their health and the things that are outside of my purview. So when I say seek God's strength, I'm not standing here today without the strength of the Lord. I'm just not. I'm broken. I'm beat up. I'm scrambling. I'm trying to make things happen. So when I say seek God, Seek the strength of the Lord. There's a reason that Scripture tells us 
that when you are weak, his strength is made perfect because it's how it's supposed to be operating to begin with. I recognize that I don't have it. I don't. Yes, God has gifted us things. He's blessed us. He's given us skills. He's given us uh, different things that we can use to work through and to heal. But ultimately, what's the foundation? Because if it's just in those things, that's going to run out too. And so seeking God's strength means relinquishing your own. That's how you experience the full blessing of it. But you might still be in the valley. But he's still with you. That's the promise. God with us. God with us. So seek his strength. Turn to the person who's there with you, who's got all the strength, who's saying, I will guide and lead you through the valley, that we will turn this space into a space of blessing. And he can do it. He can do it. Let's move on. Number two, seek your strength, but set your mind. Set your mind. I want to read a different translation, the New Living, of that same verse we've been reading, verse five. It says, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. See, the blessing is for those who not only seek God's strength, who find their strength in the Lord, but also set their mind on the things ahead. We see it in Scripture actually in a different way in the New Testament, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. So set your things, set your things, set your mind on the things above. You can set your things there too. It's probably better, right? So if I'm looking ahead, in other words, I know that I'm in the valley, but my mind is set on this is not the destination. This is part of the pilgrimage that I'm making as I'm moving towards an eternity with Jesus Christ. That should be an amen moment right there. Hallelujah. That what I see here now, even if things are really good, it's not as good as it can be. It's going to be better. And so, therefore, I move forward towards that. That's what it means to set my mind on the things that are above. So whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent, think of these things. Not the stuff, not the circumstance, not the desperation that you find yourself in. Set your mind on these things, because I know where my pilgrimage ends. So therefore, my heart might be anxious, but my mind is fixed on him. My soul may be aching, and that's a real thing, but my mind can still be fixed on him. My emotions may be racing, but my mind is fixed on him. I may have too much to do. I'm overwhelmed, or I'm, uh, I'm struggling in my marriage, or I'm struggling in my family relationships, or I've got too much debt or these things that are just kind of weighing on me in finances or things that are just uncertain or I'm dealing with health problems, my mind can still be set on him and where it is he is leading me. I've had kind of a personal revelation over the years about prayer specifically um, and persistent prayer for things. We, we often have a a thought, and this is just how my mind worked, that if I pray enough, I'm just going to wear God down. I just, <laughs> you know it's good when Shirley laughed at it, right? <laughs> like, but like, I, I think my persistent prayer for something is like, God already heard that. He, he, he already, he knew. He filed that away. He just didn't want to answer it the way I wanted him to. So I should just stop praying about it. No. Because persistent prayer isn't about achieving the end goal of getting said thing that I'm praying for. That's not what it's about. It's about me continually putting my hope and my trust, setting my mind on who God is and the power that he has, therefore seeking the strength that he has. And here, can I just, here's the thing. I know this is going to sound like the song, but don't stop believing. 
as soon as it left my mouth, I was like, no, but it's true. Like, don't just pray, just like God throw you a bone, but like actually pray and believe that he can do it. He can. This is not, this is not the destination. This is, this is where you're passing through. So therefore, sing a new song, the processional song of moving towards my heart is fixed on Zion. It's being with him. It's the, it's the place of refuge, the place of peace. It's where I'm going. And so therefore, God is with me in the valley, and he's helping me keep my mind fixed on that, on where we are going. Third point. So we talked about seek God's strength, right? <laughs> Setting my mind Last one here, and this, this is going to seem silly, but I, I want to I just point it out in Scripture here in just a second. But we need to dig a well. What? Dig a well. That's, I didn't, that's not where I thought he was going with that, right? Let, let, me, let me read verse 6 again. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Right? So... The valley, not the destination, just what we're walking through. And a lot of times we just want to get out of the valley, right? But sometimes, actually all times, the way is not out or over, but it's, it's through it. It's through it. And so where are we going? Where are we headed to the place of res- refuge, the place of peace? But we still have to travel through the valley of tears. And so... I'll read to you the King James Version of the verse we just read. This is really, really interesting. It says, Who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. Isn't isn't it fun to add the eth at the end of words? Thank you, King James. Appreciate that. But I read a really interesting commentary on just this very verse right here. It said, This is a classic statement of faith which dares to dig blessings out of hardships. So wait a second, dig a well. Dig a well in the valley. So when I'm in a dry space, I dig a hole. I dig a well because God's going to send the rain. He's going to fill it up. He's going to make it something to which I can actually pull blessings from. In the desert place, the valley. Wait a second, what? This doesn't even make sense. And yet, there it is in Scripture. Dig a hole. Catch the rain. It's like the promise buried in all of the pain. If you dig it, God will fill it. That's crazy, right? So what does that mean? Okay, dig a hole. Thanks. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, maybe just return to relationship with God. I like to say practice, and this is not mine, but practice presence with God. So how do you get to know somebody better? You spend time with them, right? This is not, it's not a trick question, right? So what does that look like in our relationship with God? Yes, it can be within the fellowship believers. Sundays are great. Outside of Sundays, even better, right? But it's also just time with Him, whether it's reading His scriptures, whether it's time in prayer, whether it's times of worship. You could do it in the car. That's when I do it. Nobody can hear my singing. It's wonderful, right? Or maybe it's just times of just sitting and listening and being still, being in His presence. In the new year, Lord willing, we're actually going to, we're going to open up the year talking about spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines and actually practicing presence. So we're going to talk more about this as we enter into the new year, but that we have to be intentional in our time with the Lord in pursuing relationship. So we're talking about seeking his strength, right? And understanding that we set our minds on who he is. We have to spend time with God. We have to press into our relationship with him to be still and to know that he is God. See, our faith is not in us, and our faith is not really even in our faith. Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. 
And so that's what we rest on. See, God never says we won't go through the valleys. But he does say you never have to go through the valleys alone. In fact, I want to read, I want to finish out this psalm. Psalm 84, verse 8. It says, O Lord of hosts, listen to this, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Even the, even the worship leaders are saying, God, hear me, hear me. Give me your ear. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts, right, the destination is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. So he's the light in the darkness, but he's also your defender, your protector. He's watching out for you. Someone needs to hear that. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, here it is. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. Blessed. Trust. Think of trust. Think of what that actually looks like. You're trusting the seats that you're sitting on right now, are you not? You are. And it's, it's, it's rewarding you for your faithfulness, right? By being faithful to uphold you. That is how, that is how we find blessing in God is that we sit, even though we're still walking through it, even though we don't understand it, he's still right there with us. God with us. God with us. He's your light in the darkness. He's peace in the storm. He's joy in the midst of strife. He's your strength when you're weak. Fix your mind on where it is that you're going. I want to invite, um, we're going to have just a time of worship. I want to invite our, our worship team to come up. And uh, also our prayer teams, if you'd like to receive prayer here in just a moment, we're going to be in the back corners here. And online you can hit the receive prayer button. Um, and I say this each week, that once we've read God's word, we, we are called to respond. And I prayed at the top, God, for a reawakening, a restoration, or maybe a new hope today. As we celebrate this week, this Advent first week, recognizing where our hope is, that even though we may be walking through the valley, and I can look around this space and know the stories, the faces, the people are walking through the valley right now. But I can also look around this room and see the face of those who have endured the valley, have a testimony of God's faithfulness and what his he can do. This is why we need relationship with one another, so that we can encourage one another within those. It's a big deal. But we need to take a moment and Set our, our minds, our hearts, honestly, on who God is, on his faithfulness. Recognizing that this is just the journey. We are sojourners. So we're just passing through. Just passing through. And the space that you're in, even if it feels like you've been in the valley for a very, very long time, there is still hope. And I'm not saying that because that's what I'm supposed to say. I'm speaking from my own testimony that there is hope. And even if we don't see it here on earth, there is still hope. Don't give up. Don't give up. Come to a space of, I'll just be honest, of humility and a recognition that I don't have what it takes. I don't have everything that I need. I need God's strength. And so therefore, I seek it out. I ask for it. And it's as simple as that. And so however you want to posture your, yourself and your hearts today, or you want to close your eyes, if you want to stand, we're going to take time to just, just play some worship and sing. 
let's, res- let's just respond and ask, God, I, I need help today. I've tried it on my own. So I want to try you again. Or maybe for the first time. Will you just agree with me in prayer? You don't have to repeat this, but you can make this your own. God, we seek God, I just sense the heaviness. I know the I know the valley place. I know the desperation that comes from that. Holy Spirit, would you make yourself evident right now in a tangible way? For some, we've given up. They've given up hope. They feel like there is no hope. They feel outside of your love. Holy Spirit, speak to their hearts right now. Reveal yourself as the comforter. God, we want to set our minds on you, on your city of refuge, the place to which we are going to on this journey. God, remind us that where we're at right now is not the destination. It is simply the space that you are walking with us through. Thank you for your presence. God, we acknowledge today that you are God with us, that you sent your son, Jesus, here on this earth to be with us, but also to save us, to pay the penalty for our sins that we could never pay. So we thank you for that. We believe, God, I pray in this season you restore belief, belief in who you are and what it is that you can do. Lord, I pray you restore hope, that you reawaken that wonder for who you are in us that we would never be the same. God, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to receive further prayer, please, please go to the, the corners, hit online, but let's take a moment and just worship the Lord together.